Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ni hao. So, the after lunch slot, this is one of the dreaded slots of the conference because you're now full of lunch and you're going to potentially fall asleep. So, that's why we have put together such an all star panel to, to kind of jolt you back to life and keep you going for the rest of the day. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, indeed, I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. Um, I'll just, again, a little bit looking forward. Uh, um, we obviously have this session and then, and then our, our last session of the day all in this room, after which we will be going to the gala dinner tonight, for those of you who are joining. It's at, the, it's at Mint, which is a very nice nightclub, uh, and also very impressive space. So hope you will all join us for that. Uh, we'll give a bit more detail, but there's coaches that will be leaving directly after the last session. There's also uh, directions if anybody's driving or going on their, their own you can pick up directions uh, at the registration desk. So I uh, do hope you will all join us for that. Um, maybe just a little recap so far on the day for those of you who were with us or weren't with us. In the first session, we heard uh, a lot of information about, about policy, about the direction. Obviously, the China, China is rebalancing, a bit lower growth than we've seen, probably about 7% GDP. Automotive market also slower growth. The numbers so far, I think, this year are maybe about 3% uh, sales, increase 5% production. This is obviously much less than we've seen in, in recent years, but this is the opportunity or, or indeed the objective to, to move from quantity to quality and, and indeed to, from, from, uh, to, to, to higher value. And that, that's a message that goes very much through the supply chain. Uh, and we picked up on that some of in our last session talking about uh, improving supply chain efficiency, uh, optimization, end-to-end uh, -end, uh, strategies. In this session, we're going to actually kind of maybe look a little bit more horizontally in some ways. Uh, the theme of the session is working together. Uh, so we're looking at ways in the industry that we might collaborate, and that collaboration might be amongst manufacturers, it might be uh, amongst logistics providers, tier suppliers upstream and downstream. Uh, indeed, as we'll hear, in many cases, it's actually about collaborating even within an organization and how do you sort of navigate between the different, the different functions, the different potential silos uh, within those. So um, that's a lot of, we have a, a great panel to kind of discuss the different uh, details there. We're seated a little bit in reverse uh, how we'll, we normally would. Uh, our first speaker, James Hu, who's the regional director of the Asia Pacific Global Trade and Compliance for Delphi, uh, will have to leave a bit early. So James will speak first, and then what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll allow for a few questions afterwards, if there, if there are any questions, uh, so that then, uh, James, you'll be able to leave you know, as, as you need. Um, and then we'll hear from Magnus Oedling, who's the uh, project leader for Inbound China at Volvo Cars. And, and then we'll also have Bill Pollock, who's the CEO of Convertible Trailer Manufacturers. And uh, after the, that presentation, we'll, we'll, have a, a, we'll, we'll again return to Q&A uh, with Bill and Magnus, uh, and indeed anyone else in the audience who, who would like to comment and participate. So let's now uh, invite James up to the stage. Hi, good afternoon. So uh, I'm sorry, and uh, because and uh, I have some things wrong to leave early. So any kind of the questions after my speech, and uh, you guys can contact with the meeting committee, and uh, then I try to and uh, feedback very soon and uh, by the email. Okay. So let's move on for the Delphi uh, part. And my job is work for the global trend and the compliance. Okay. And uh, we are very very related with the logistic, but my key job is not for logic, so I, I try to and, uh, explain and how the Delphi and the work for the global and the trade and compliance, but also cooperate with the logistics very closely. Okay. Okay, first we go for the Delphi uh, introduction, and I think the video, I don't know, the, okay, the video can work. To move and be moved is what drives us. To rev motors, imaginations, and everyday lives. From innovations that entertain and keep us safe, to powertrain systems that inspire the scenic route. 
our robust product and service solutions are paving the way towards new standards of excellence. For better mileage and longer trips, for greener savings and a healthier planet, fueled by determination, collaboration, and technological grace. Okay, so this is the Delphi, and uh, okay, we are around uh, okay, 19,000 okay, uh, staff in the worldwide, and the revenue in the okay, 2016 is around and the 16 billions. Okay, so we have around and uh, uh, sorry, and we have around 116, uh, uh, 160,000 people and in the 32 countries. So Delphi. Of course, Delphi is a very, very and a big global and uh, and uh, multinational companies. Okay. Okay. So uh, Delphi in China, we have around and uh, two point seven billions and uh, in the twenty three revenues and around and twenty six and uh, thousand people in the China. So. Okay, and uh, compared with the global and uh, China is around, okay, and not so many peoples, but then uh, actually, and uh, we contribute and uh, over, okay, uh, around a 30 percentage for the revenue for that. Okay, okay so this is the Delphi China and the footprint. Okay, so and uh, from the Bison, and uh, this is very in the north of the China. Okay, most north of the China, then and uh, and the Changchun, and the then through and the Shanghai, uh, Shanghai area. Then we go to the Chongqing and the Chengdu area, and also the Guangdong area. So Delphi's footprint is almost in uh, all kind of the China and the locations, and uh, which in line with the okay with the automobile and the industry business in the China. Okay, so this is the Delphi, and now and I go to and to explain and the, the challenges in the, okay, in the trade management in the China's. Okay, this is what we face in the, in the China and the trade compliance. Okay, so for the China and trade compliance and the currently, uh, what we like to uh, say and actually, and Delphi faced the same situation and uh, like the all of the company in the China. Okay, and uh, maybe not only in the China, in the Asia Pacific, we face the same in the status. So, okay, many country, okay, so we, 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 we okay, looks the whole in the worldwide and the economic, uh, the environment and it beca becomes open and open because and, uh, we are talking about a lot of the FTA, okay, and we are talking about a lot of the duty free and talking about a lot of the trade and uh, uh, reduced trade uh, uh, and the cost. But actually, okay, we are at the same time, so we face, okay, mm -hmm. a lot of the non-tariff trade barriers. And at that time, okay, at, at the same time, I think the non-tariff trade barriers is also and become bigger and bigger, okay, and with the FTA and become bigger and bigger. So, this is the balance and for all of the, okay, all of the country and I think mostly is in China, okay. So what we talk about is the challenge, okay, is how to, okay, we join, okay, uh, we enjoy and all for the FTA and the conditions and we got the benefit from the FTA. But at the same time, I think we need to think about and how to avoid the non-tariff trade barriers. So this is related and all of the trade flow and in the logistics flow. Okay. So here I like to and a little bit explain and I think you guys are all the expert for the logistic period but okay for the related with the trade compliance I think and currently we are talking about the FTA, the AU, the anti-dumping and the okay uh, city pad. So this is okay. Maybe you already know that, but uh, let me and uh, just a f 
uh, spend a, a little bit time to explain for us. So FTA, we already know. So this is the free trade agreement and we of the country and the country. China, we face a lot of the FTA already, and but not so for the big countries like US and like the Japan, like the Korea, okay, for that kind of the, the, the trade business. But now, and I think, and uh, we already got the China and the Switzerland FTA in the last year, and we were very closely and uh, to face the new FTA for the China and the uh, and the Korea. So, okay. So this is most of the benefit, and we we will face more and more in the China because for the FTA we'll have a more and more different different FTA with the China and the dif uh, other different country. Okay. But here we talk about and uh, none. Okay, and the tariff uh, barriers. So. A lot of the things, and uh, okay, okay, we, we talk about for the AU. So AU is the category, okay, which the the custom identify for how your business, okay, is the uh, category A or category B, and uh, for the trade business with the uh, with the international trade. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is some kind of the uh, custom uh, credit. Okay, based on the the AU in the in the before China. Okay, we, we, we not follow with the AU, but now, and I think in the last year, the China custom, okay, they ask mm -hmm. maybe most of the, okay, and the, the, the enterprise, okay, we will face the AEO category and application and certify and uh, very soon. So anti-dumping, okay, uh, I think we all know that. So this is the non-tariff and the barriers and uh, for all of the enterprise we are facing in the China. So, Okay, and uh, we have a very long list and the dumping and the for for the automobile, uh, I think, and the product list also. Okay, so most of the, that okay will be caused uh, uh, some kind of the issues and with the okay with the with the with the trading and the barriers. City pack is the security. So now and I think not so many in the company face for that, but I think the, the U.S. government will face uh, will force that and a lot. Okay, we go to the next. Okay, so we talk about a lot of the FTA, so we will face the challenge, how to use, okay, most of the FTA to, to benefit our company. And then and we talk about uh, non-tariff, okay, and uh, trade barriers. Then we will think about how to manage that, how to face that, and how to avoid that kind of the problem. So I leave this kind of the question because and we want to talk all of this kind of the issues, okay, it's all related with the products, related with the database behind for this kind of the products, related with all of some kind of the, uh, the agreement, the terms, okay, based, based on that. So we will think about that and how to, okay, use the system, integrate system to manage that, to get most of the benefit and avoid the barriers. Okay, this is currently the Delphi and the trade management and in the Asia. So actually in the trade and the, okay, the trade and the compliance control actually and we, 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 we run all of the control point in all of the trade flow and from the supplies to the end of the customer. So this is including all of the bonded and the non-bonded, that means and the duty free and not duty free. Okay, actually, and uh, what I talk about, like the FTA and uh, like all of the uh, non-tariff barriers and we control point is all related to this kind of the process. Okay, then we go to the, okay, and the last topic. So this is, we, we, we okay, we explain to the Delphi and how to use the current system and the co to collaboration and for the customer and the supplies. Okay, so this is for the, the tier one system and the design, and, uh, okay, and we do it for the Delphi now. Okay, currently, and uh, we set up all of the trade compliance regulation. So this is including the FTA and the non-FTA like issues. So we set up all of that kind of the regulation and, uh, and into that system, and we identify that kind of the regulation and based on the database control and also all of the transaction date, okay. So that means an inbound and outbound. We also generate that kind of the database by the system. And so, 
everything that kind of the, okay, related with the trade flow and for the shipment and also for the, uh, for the, for the, uh, for the trade compliance, okay, we use that kind of database and we set up the system and into, okay, to support and how to, okay, get all of the, all of the FTA benefit and also all, uh, avoid all of the risk for that. So this is the system currently help us, help Delphi for all of the trade flow, uh, trade flow and from the supplies to the end customers. Okay, so here, okay, we are, okay, we are talking about and uh, for all of the integrate and the database and uh, okay, we use on our current tools for the system, for the trade network. So this including and all of the inbound, okay, and shipment information, inbound products information, and from the supplies, also and in including all of the outbound and the information to the end customer. So, okay, beside the, the, the products information, also we set up the regulation and, uh, okay, from the customs and from the different authority uh, like the security. So we set up all of the regulation into that kind of the system. Then and the regulation and the lim uh, regulation limitation can be calculated autom automatically based on the, all of the product database to calculate how to get the FTA benefit and how to avoid the, the, the barriers, okay. So this is, okay, currently in the, what we, what we in the use for the Delphi. Okay, so finally we like to say, okay, so currently in the, we use all of this kind of the system to manage and for the, for the Delphi and the tree flow and this is finally and we got the, the, the purpose and this is for the Delphi's purpose. So for the, okay, for the safe, for the green, and for the bad connect. Bad connect from the supply and to the customers. Also, trade management, and we are not only focused on the compliance, and we also focus on the value for that kind of the trade compliance control, okay? And uh, we work a lot, okay, through that kind of the system for the global supplies, and to understand and what's the Delphi and the system currently we are working and that to meet our expectation. And we, st we know we still have a long way to go, but actually current system are already, and uh, we draw in the benefit and, uh, and from that kind of the control, okay. So still Delphi is, uh, okay, is, uh, okay, we are working in the, for a top tie, and we are the, 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 group, uh, the growing and the global and company and in the automobile, and we hope we will keep on that. Okay, I think that's all, and thanks everybody for that. Thank you very much, James. Um, as I mentioned, since James does have to leave, uh, if, if there is any questions, um, we would ask you to address, address them to him now, because uh, like I said, he's gonna leave by the time we we get to the Q&A. So is, is there any question from the audience for James at this point? <coughs> well, James is going anyway, so. Um, okay, well thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll let James go. And uh, thank you, James. Okay, then in that case, we'll, we'll just move on uh, with the rest of our panel before we have Q&A with, uh, with the rest. So now I'd like to invite Magnus Odling from Volvo Cars. Good afternoon. Does that mean I have more time if I need it? <laughs> I'm not sure I will. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my uh, second attendance. Uh, last time was uh, in Berlin two years ago. And uh, I think uh, from Volvo Cars, it's uh, really great to support uh, a conference and an initiative like this and to contribute to the working together theme um, in um, this industry. Um, before 
I start, I would like to reflect shortly on what the representative from NDRC said this morning, um, because I liked what he said. He said, um, they are working for fair competition in the market, improving the infrastructure. They want the market and the industry to take the lead in the development, and they will just facilitate and multimodal in focus. So for me, that was a very good uh, statement uh, to me as a customer of the industry and a user of um, uh, the framework that uh, the government actually can provide. So that was a good start for me this morning. Um, personally, I'm new to China. I arrived here to Shanghai in October. So. I also see this as a great opportunity to meet uh, many of you to get a feeling for what the industry is. And um, there's also a long uh, list of participants from uh, different players in the industry. So uh, I, this will be the first, uh, but not the last, uh, attendance from my side to this fora. Um, when I was asked by Louis and Christopher to um, speak here today, um, I reflected, of course, on what could I speak to on the subject of working together, and I chose for focusing on my experiences from historically working on the supplier side, but now being on the OEM side, the uh, buying side, and try to reflect on what that means for my view on a relationship with a logistic service provider of some kind. So really trying to give you a little bit of the soft side and my view, and partly Volvo's view um, on uh, relationship uh, in the automotive business. Um, then, of course, there are many more relationships that we need to nurture, including those two are tier one suppliers like Delphi, and uh, how we can work together. Um, first, I will start with um, two slides on Volvo and a little bit of background, but it's also uh, connected a little bit to China, so I hope you bear with me. Um, this displays the journey of Volvo cars from, it says 2011 here, but it really started in 2010 when Geely Automotive purchased uh, Volvo cars from Ford Motor Company. And that was the start of this journey where the plan was uh, laid out, the strategy was laid out in 2011. And um, not Long time after that, uh, there was also a plan for logistics, that logistics should be a more uh, important part of uh, Volvo cars, which has previously been outsourced to either an in-house 4PL or an uh, outsourced uh, external 4PL. Uh, so that was actually a board decision to uh, take logistics home and to make it a strategic competence of the company. Um, also, um, the summary of this slide is that Volvo Cars' ambition is to be a global, profitable, premium uh, automotive brand. And uh, that journey started as well. And as you can see here, it's about new products, new platforms, uh, new um, powertrains, and um, taking a substantial uh, growth in volume with the long-term goal uh, around 2020 to uh, produce and sell 800,000 vehicles uh, globally. And globally, you can actually see, I made a change to the uh, slide here yesterday because it was not long ago that uh, the announcement that Volvo cars will build a factory in the US. And this comes after um, many, many years between the two uh, first uh, plants in Europe until we built and opened uh, our factory in Chengdu in 2013. And then we're ready to build our fourth and fifth plant uh, actually uh, within quite a short time. So this is a, a big journey for Volvo, uh, which is a Swedish company under Chinese ownership. And uh, we try to uh, combine the best of those two worlds. As you can see, this is China. Um, Chengdu is uh, where we started uh, production in 2013. At the end of 2013, we are now operational with uh, two models, and we're doing uh, one and a half shift uh, full production. We um, have also in 2013 opened our uh, second engine plant globally in Shanghai. 
And uh, also last year we opened in uh, Daqing, we'll, uh, which is currently uh, SKD production, but will go into uh, complete built units uh, during next year. So this is a big step for Volvo, and it coincides with uh, the volume increase that we have, uh, the ambition we have globally, but also uh, here in China. Last year we sold a little bit over 80,000 vehicles, and many of them were actually produced here in China with our two um, main selling models being produced in Chengdu. Um, that was equal to a 32% growth, and if you were awake this morning, you could compare that with a market growth of 6.7%. So we were very happy with that. Um, for China, the uh, midterm target is to uh, produce and sell 200,000 vehicles in China. Um, Another way to describe our journey and our growth in China is to look at number of employees. In 2010, um, when we were not represented with an industrial structure here in China, we were 160 people. And um, this year we will uh, very soon pass 4,000 people, uh, including then production in three plants and a full-fledged uh, headquarter with R&D and design and as well logistics here in Shanghai. Um, the last thing I will mention about Volvo uh, specifically is that uh, later, or quite soon, uh, we will be the first premium brand producing and exporting a car uh, uh, out of China to the US. And uh, in fact, I have a colleague here in the back uh, who's uh, working on setting up the logistics for that new supply chain uh, as we speak. So. In the next slide, trying to match my message to the theme of this session, um, matching supply and demand is, of course, a, a well-known logistics um, uh, phrase or statement. Uh, but here, I would like to uh, put it into concept of uh, the relationship between me as a buyer and some of you as a seller, and the importance to be aligned um, this has to be the starting point of working together because if there is no match between what I want to buy and you want to sell, there will be no sell. So that is very important. And I would like to point at myself first and saying, understand what it is that you want to buy. And that starts with the strategy. And I think actually in the previous session, we could see that a little bit in the Q and A with, uh, between the tier one supplier, Vistion, and the two suppliers, maybe not being perfectly aligned I think they can be aligned, but they need to listen to each other and see what are they buying and what are they selling. And uh, I think that was a reflection for me that I had intended to, to mention today anyway. Um, at Volvo, you could say we use a range of suppliers between what could be defined as 2PL all the way up to 4PL. And for me, that is uh, depending on a number of things. What is the scope of the service? What type of service are we looking for? What is the geography? What is the maturity of our organization? Um, and what is the priority from Volvo cars on this specific activity? Um, I have previously uh, talked with Christopher uh, about uh, what I call two and a half PL, meaning there are things, it's not black and white. The world is often gray, so, um, and you have to, to have an alignment uh, on what level. And with two and a half PL, I mean that from our side, for example, in inbound logistics in Europe, we are driving the planning, we are driving the operations, we are planning transportation, but we are working with both two PLs and three PLs. And then the three PLs and the two PLs have to find the balance and the level of uh, service that we require uh, in our uh, transportation management setup. Um, then, of course, you as a buyer have to understand your customer. I think that's one uh, one in the uh, selling book. Um, but it is a fact that logistics suppliers, by nature, are flexible, so they can be many things to many. And um, especially in automotive, uh, we need to talk to each other to understand what it is that we want to buy and sell. Uh, also in this slide, uh, at the end I mentioned uh, the need to be perfectly aligned with your purchasing colleagues, meaning that is inside Volvo cars. 
and I'm happy to have one of my purchasing colleagues here today um, because they also need to understand the industry, need to understand my strategy, know where I'm going in order to be able to support with me, work with me and with our potential and existing suppliers to develop our business. So that is an important statement from my side. So if you have managed to find a match between the supply and demand, then it's high time to start working together. And often you break working together into three parts, uh, operational, tactical, and strategical. And for me, coming into the automotive business, operational goes on 24 seven, every shift, every hour, every minute. Uh, as you know, the tact in the plants is often one car a minute, and uh, that puts a tremendous need for sense of urgency uh, throughout the supply chain, throughout uh, the plants, and uh, of course for us as uh, internal suppliers uh, to the plants and the material planning uh, teams. So sense of urgency uh, under operational is very important. Then the other point I'm making here is that tactical incremental development week by week, month by month, internally as well as together with our suppliers. That is what makes a difference. And here I see a big difference between a high performing supplier and a supplier that is maybe not performing so well in my view. Um, to sum that up, you could say that tactical improvements compared to strategic in, uh, discussions initiatives are very they are come faster, they are more tangible, they can be measured, and they happen inside the existing contract length. So um, that's a recommendation then for the suppliers in here. Uh, also on the slide I put uh, two of the uh, core values of Volvo cars, which is aim high, or rather the behaviors. Aim high, move fast, challenge and respect. I think that also fits nicely together to this theme working together, challenge each other, respect each other, trust each other, but have high ambitions together. Um, so if that is working together, then that is building on a relationship as well. And the first and most important point for me in this slide is that uh, it requires an ability to put commercials aside from business development and improvements and constructive discussions. And in fact, this is where it, the positive part of having a strong purchasing process and the internal purchasing organization, because we can leave the commercials to the pros to discuss while I can focus on developing my logistics strategy and the performance of my supply chain. Um, I'm also mentioning up here that executive support from the supplier side works. I think not only because it gets the attention, it, uh, we are worth at the supplier by the uh, commercial officer or the CEO being present and be taking part in our relationship. I think it's also um, uh, helping us to get the right things on the agenda and to have uh, that type of discussions maybe once or twice a year. Uh, lastly, I have a responsibility. It is not only the customer that is to blame for a poor relationship. Uh, I have to contribute to that uh, with at least 50% uh, to, to build a successful long-term solution or uh, relation. Um, so coming from the other side of the business, I know a little bit about this and uh, what I have done previously and what my preferences are. Uh, so this is more for reflection for you to think about how are you actually measuring and rewarding people internally and how is that supporting and driving your business. So the top three are maybe more top of mind and the bottom three are maybe not always existing. Uh, and I can also see uh, that there might be differences uh, between more mature markets uh, and less mature markets. Um, but I clearly see differences between individual suppliers in this area uh, where I can see how that relates into the behavior of my key account manager. Uh, 
Um, I mentioned briefly before that uh, it was decided by the board in 2011 to make logistics a strategic competence at Volvo Cars. And trying to put it into the working together concept, here is why. And uh, the basic idea is that we want to work from transportation perspective together with our peers inside Volvo Cars uh, in a much better way. And for that, we need to be more of us. We need to be in more places. We need to be where it happens. And we need to have uh, greater knowledge. And of course, that uh, takes time to build up that organization, that competence, and that presence. Um, saying that, for us, we are open to learn from our suppliers because you're even more out there where it happens. So we don't think that we know best just because we want to have the competence. And lastly, I think internally, we have a lot to learn from the plants and the manufacturing colleagues because they are, I think, 10 times better than us at being lean. Um, here, my statement is that if the customer experience or my experience is good, that helps me to work together in a better way. And I mentioned some of the things that makes me feel better. So hit the numbers every day. Um, how is the customer experience, the people relationship? Is IT working? Is implementation working, etc.? But I would like to sum it up here that you see actually that this is a, a seat from a car. And uh, as I say, it should feel safe, fun, smooth, and in control when you're behind the wheel. And I think that's uh, my summary of a relationship. At the end, um, a little bit on what, why I am in China and uh, what my focus is uh, in Volvo Cars. Um, we have an insourcing strategy, building competence, uh, but this goes together with the corporate strategy where we will be much more global. We recently set up production in China. We're going to set up production in the US. We're almost doubling our volume. And therefore, logistics needs to follow in those footsteps. So we want to take control of transportation management uh, in-house. And we want to operate and plan and lead our transportation ourselves. Last slide is also about working together inside Volvo cars. Uh, we refer, uh, someone this morning referred to it as the value chain, so do we. And in fact, this was the driving force behind a uh, organizational change in the company two years ago, where we first combined purchasing and manufacturing organizationally under one senior vice president. And then below that, we brought together supply quality and logistics, both all the way from order planning to um, inbound transportation to in-plant logistics to outbound transportation. We are all under the same management and we have the same ambition to improve. And uh, up here you can see some of the initiatives that has been running, executed, completed, and are in uh, work in progress and to be started uh, within the value chain for Volvo cars. And, uh, my uh, little project is uh, up on the left uh, for inbound transportation in China. And this beautiful car is literally on its way to China. Uh, I think, Rodrigo, it's uh, due to arrive in uh, two, three weeks uh, on a chip. So we're very excited for our new models. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, I think there's quite a lot for you all to absorb there, uh, not least the, the physical expansion uh, that Volvo is undergoing in China, but also globally, uh, and obviously the strategic role that logistic plays in that, the fact that, I mean, Magnus said logistic has to follow, uh, and, and Volvo is making it very clear that logistics is, is, a, is a strategic resource uh, there, and it wants providers to, to give it the right the right service. I think uh, the interesting points about how um, how you kind of find the balance between what the car maker needs and what the providers offer. Um, it's, I think, a rather humble position as well, since we know customer is king, or in China, even customer is God. Um, although I will note that Magnus said you have to be 24-7 operations. I mean, that's perhaps even more than God, because at least in most religion, God rests at least on one day, right? So. <laughs> 
But uh, no, but I, I think that sets you up for some, some good dialogue and Q&A and obviously some exciting projects ahead. Um, keeping on this sort of theme of collaboration and, and I think looking at, at other efficiencies and other parts of the supply chain that, that we can bring together, um, I'm now going to invite Bill Pollock from CTM. Thanks, Christopher. Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Pollock from Convertible Trailer Manufacturing. Uh, today's theme, of course, working together. I'd like to talk about it in relation to the project, the Convertible Trailer Project. And some of you may have heard already about this project. Uh, we are targeting a specific problem in the industry. Um, just before lunch, that uh, second panel, I think Chris had uh, asked uh, the panel what the biggest waste uh, was in the industry today, in the auto logistics industry, and uh, I didn't hear anybody mention anything about empty miles or underutilization of auto carrier assets. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, that's our target, that's what we're doing, that's what we want to address. And we're not going to be able to do this unless we start working together as an industry at all levels. So we want to work with the auto manufacturers, all of them. This problem that we have in the industry today applies to each and every individual here at all levels, auto manufacturers especially. They're the ones that want to see decreased costs, yet we're running around with our equipment being underutilized. Logistics groups, same thing. We need their participation. Can't do it without them. Governments, on many levels, of course. Here in China, we are waiting for some announcement of a particular legislation that's going to define the auto carriers, the road assets, what length that they're going to be, what, what's going to be the new legal standard. Because today, it seems like it's the Wild West, by my observation. So we want to work with governments. So. Today, uh, many of you may know who Lower Industries is, a company from France. They're a worldwide auto carrier manufacturer. They are our partners today. They've, they share in the vision of innovating. They've been worldwide innovators in this field, very niche industry, of course. And uh, Robert Lohr himself has been in this business longer than most of us have been alive in this room. So we, uh, we have a lot to thank him for. And, and now uh, he is further supporting innovation and development in this industry by partnering with convertible trailer manufacturing. We want to pro provide for the Chinese market safe, legal, profitable, efficient, and environmentally responsible equipment. We don't want to compromise any of those. We want to make sure that you guys can operate here in China just as we do in other places in the world. And we know that there's a problem in this industry today where everybody's building bigger and bigger equipment, thinking it's going to solve the problem, but you're compromising these other principles. And, and we think that we can help change this and improve this. Because we, um, uh, we know that there's imbalance in automotive finished vehicle outbound flows. Because if there was a, a balance every time, I wouldn't need to be up here on stage. I would have no purpose. If you could go and load up a load of vehicles with, on whether it's road, rail, or ocean, go deliver your vehicles to its destination, and then turn around and move over a few miles, kilometers, and pick up another load and come back, it would be a pretty simple story costs would go down significantly. Our partnership with uh, Inform is about identifying where all of those synergies exist. How can we use an auto carrier asset to now, after it's offloaded its uh, load of finished vehicles, what can we do with that asset to fill it up and bring it home, perhaps back to base or to the next pickup point? So, Inform is uh, uh, an advanced software automotive logistics group 
that's able to identify many different ways of finding the right solution for your specific problem. Because of imbalanced flows, perhaps we can combine automotive outbound flows with maybe some automotive inbound flows, or maybe just general freight. But that asset does not have to run empty. And at the end of the day, even if we bring back something that is non-automotive, the automotive industry benefits simply because that equipment, they're no longer paying for the underutilization of that asset. So yes, we have an agreement with Inform, and we are studying automotive flows all around the world today. And China is a key target for us. We want to help you figure out where you can synergize. So this is a very common image, empty auto carriers, empty auto carrier rail cars, and empty row, row vessels. The waste in road, rail, and ocean is considerable. I want to plant this thought in everybody's mind that in the future, and maybe the future, maybe this is now, that there is no distinction or there will be no distinction between waste and energy. If there does not need to be any waste, we can convert that into something productive. Automotive inbound and outbound departments all operate in silos, independent of each other. I think we all know this. Sometimes they work on different floors in a building. Sometimes they work in different buildings. Quite often they work in different cities altogether. Our auto carrier assets today in the world in road, rail, and ocean have never allowed them to work together, to collaborate, sit across the desk from each other and discuss how they can move outbound with inbound or outbound with general freight. Never happened. We're here to change that. General dry goods in the world today, they operate somewhat independently, although inbound is integrated with them. But automotive seems to be off on its own. And for us to get the benefits of scaling our operations on the automotive logistics side, the only way we're going to do it is by joining the big game, and that's general freight. That's our belief. Without compromising the quality that everybody's looking for. The automotive sector is very particular. We understand that. We need to provide new technology that can help us use our equipment better. So this is an example here in China. I'm sure you've all seen this, and um, I find it amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, you guys are really, really full on your way out. But on your way back, you're still empty. You're still empty. That equipment, doesn't matter how many pieces it's hauling out, it's still coming back empty. And maybe if you haul twice as many on the way out, you're kind of making up for coming back empty, and maybe that's the answer. But once again, you're you're, you're compromising legality and safety, efficiency. You're compromising that, and I think we need to change that. Our studies show that there's a $75 billion a year annual waste in the auto carrier or the auto logistics industry worldwide today. That's a tremendous number. That's simply because of the underutilization of assets today. We know that your numbers here are up to 50% empty. And we know that there's certain unique situations where, yeah, you're able to go and drop off a load and you can pick up another load nearby. That does exist. It, it exists in Europe, exists in the US, exists all over the world, but in a minority of the cases. But in the big picture, that number is massive. Not to mention, of course, the carbon footprint in the industry, we call this turn and burn. Load up one way, go out, drop them off, and turn around, run back home as quick as you can and pick up your next load. Turn and burn, turn and burn, turn and burn. There's, and the whole world's doing it today. It's not just here in China. It's happening in India. It happens in the US too. We're just getting this concept going. And we need participation. We want to work together with everybody. Ch change this. So the CTM solution, we'll talk a bit about that. These are some pictorials here, some renders that will 
put some thoughts in your mind as to what the possibilities are. Should we be hauling just vehicles? I don't know. I'm not a, not a logistics expert whatsoever. You guys are. And maybe your systems will tell you that one day, yeah, maybe we're not just hauling vehicles on the outbound, maybe we're combining some of our outbound movements with perhaps other products. Maybe some automotive parts, who knows. Our carrier systems are just as efficient as standard auto carriers, but at the end of the day, they're capable of doing more. There's a glimpse uh, into the auto box concept as well that we are developing and bringing to the market. This is what our equipment looks like after it's offloaded of vehicles. It looks like a standard 53 foot, this is an American uh, model, 53 foot standard uh, step deck trailer. What could we do with that? Imagine, lots of containers to haul all over, all over the world. This is just but one example. And the truck doesn't care what it hauls, it really doesn't. I've asked it and it doesn't care. This is real examples. I bring this one up all the time simply because the payload here, the, the, for you transport companies here, this load here paid more than the load of automotive uh, finished vehicles. So the less than load business, it pays well as well. So now you can suddenly turn your empty miles into more than double your revenue. The auto box is another product. We're targeting, finding, creating dry space so that we can use road, rail, and ocean assets, auto carrier assets. Use those, those empty decks, to haul something by creating what's called the auto box, a collapsible mini dry intermodal container. 20 of them equal one 40-foot cube. Collapsibility, relocation costs could be reduced significantly. Stackability, of course. Trackability, using the latest technology, electronic support, whatever is out there to help us find our, our uh, products. Intermodal on auto carrier assets at this time. We are working on creating intermodal capabilities throughout the entire system so that they, they, they can integrate with uh, container systems today. Versatility. Our auto box can be shipped on any flat deck product, doesn't matter. It is purpose built for our convertible trailer, of course, but it can fit on any flat deck asset. Line side ready. There's a possibility that we could load these auto boxes up and fill them up with your parts and bring them right into the factory for usage with engines or alternators or what have you. We want to provide you new options, new ideas. There's a whole 40, 50% of opportunity today that you can all play with. Use as you wish. Turn and earn instead of turn and burn. That's the, that's the slogan that we want everybody to remember. When you go home today, you go see those empty auto carriers going down the highway again and again and again. Think about this. Once again, should there be a distinction between waste and energy? I don't think so. I think the future will force us. We need to be proactive though. Why not get ahead of the game? We want to work with you guys. So feel free, contact us anytime. Go to our website, convertibletrailers.com. Work with us. We're here to help you. And that's it. Oh, hang on, we got one more little video. Every year, the auto transportation industry wastes 75 billion. That's billion with a B on inefficient transport of automobiles. And every year, 20 billion kilograms of needless CO2 is wasted by this inefficiency, hauling a full load one way and nothing on its way back home. This is known as turn and burn. Think of how many times you've seen a carrier just like this one, empty. We're willing to bet it's over 40% of the time, and that's being conservative. CTM has a solution that is revolutionizing the industry worldwide. 
Introducing the first auto logistics revolution, the convertible trailer by CTM. We call it the revolution. Auto transport companies can now haul a load of vehicles to the dealer, then within minutes convert to a flat deck trailer capable of hauling a fully fledged 40 foot container or freight of any type that a standard flat deck can. Even better, it can haul mixed loads, vehicles and freight. Nothing else can do this and nothing else will. It's patented worldwide. Our Revolution trailer may look like a standard trailer, but it's completely different. Simple hydraulic controls assist the operator in offloading his hull in minutes. The vehicles are cleared and a few more hydraulic transformations converts a historically one-job trailer into a multi-freight hauling system. With a basic loader, the trailer is now ready to fill your empty backhaul miles with real cold hard profits. Adios turn and burn, hello turn and earn. Don't get left behind, be a part of this global revolution. Convertible trailers can be designed and customized to meet any regional regulations and requirements worldwide. Visit ConvertibleTrailers.com for detailed information on this game-changing innovation. CTM, transforming auto logistics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, again, sometimes it's uh, seemingly simple ideas that can really change quite a lot. And uh, I mean, I'm, I know there's a lot more complexity that probably goes into building the trailer, but obviously the idea is something I think that is pretty obvious to many people. But for whatever reason, some barriers have always existed. Perhaps, as Bill mentioned, it's because the people required to make it happen sit in different buildings, or perhaps in some cases it's just not applicable for a particular flow, but, but obviously the opportunity to explore that is now here, and, and it's certainly worth considering. So, so thank you for that, Bill. We have time for, for some questions. Um, the usual format, um, just say your name and company. Although the presentations were in English, you are, again, very welcome to ask the questions in Mandarin. and. Uh, our, our colleagues on stage will be forced to answer back in Mandarin this time, I think. So, no, we do have the translation. So, is there any questions uh, at the floor from this time? Okay, as usual, I have to disappoint you. You're not going. You're not going to get your coffee earlier because I'll have some questions myself. Um, Magnus, I think one of the points that, that I was quite interested in, in is this sort of balance between the two PL, four PL, or let's say trying to find the the, the right service. Do you, have you found in, perhaps, perhaps this is more relevant to the experience in Europe so far than, than in necessarily in China, but have you found that suppliers tend to want to oversell or upsell from 2PL to 3PL, 3PL to 4PL, rather than necessarily um, sort of adjust, you know, following your, your lead on that? I f would say that it's about discussing with the suppliers what we want, because here, when it comes to inbound transportation in Europe and soon in China, we have a clear vision of what we want to do, how we want to steer our suppliers. So it comes from that, and that can be described in a specification. You need to do this, you need to follow this process, you need to report by then, and then that is where I say, we are open to work with three PLs according to that specification, and we are working, uh, willing to work with two PLs that are able to live up to that specification. Mm -hmm. And that's where I say two and a half is maybe a good uh, compromise mm -hmm. to, to uh, describe the service that we uh, require in the in-house transportation management setup. Mm -hmm. Does that sort of suggest that, that, I don't know if preference is the right word, but that you're in some ways looking so some asset base, or you know, might it not necessarily come down to whether they own assets or, or not? I think I said that depends on geography, scope, maturity, uh, volume, etc. We have uh, almost one PL setup, right, where we have direct contract with asset owners mm -hmm. um, on a truck shuttle or on a uh, block train, etc. But then, uh, if we zoom in on the core and main number of transactions, uh, we are in that 
two and a half yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. But then we have also four PL uh, relationships today for different reasons. Um, so it, it really depends on, on where our priorities and uh, resources and competences are located. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from the audience? Bill, one of the things that sort of st strikes me when I see a presentation or think about it, and I guess it's probably not the right metaphor to use in China because there's a China version of Uber, which I don't remember what it's called, but you think of an Uber-style kind of system where um, freight is open and, and you might be able to catch a load using some sort of technology, you know? I mean, could you envision moving in that sort of direction for a product like yours? It seems some sort of fit. Yeah, you do mention the Uber system, and uh, we've studied uh, the Uber system, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'm sure most of you are, they, they're a taxi service, they're a, a, a software-based um, handset system that can match uh, customers to uh, assets, I guess, taxi assets. And that very same principle, I think, could be applied to automotive logistics without a doubt in my mind. We just need to begin to develop it. And I think uh, that's, that's um, one of our goals is work towards that style of, a, of an operation, our partnership with Inform. That's what we're targeting is finding a way to get real-time information to match up trucks, empty trucks, available trucks to get them integrated into automotive logistics more, help drive the waste out of the industry. So does that answer your question? Sure. Any hands yet? You're going to leave all the work to me, I can tell, actually. From them. That's OK. That's what they pay me for, I guess. Um, Magnus, at the beginning, uh, you, you sort of praised the, the comments from the NDRC this morning, uh, the movement towards transparency and, and, and a market-led sort of system. I mean. Again, I, 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 you can speak generally on this, but are, uh, hopefully, do you think this is, this is still just words at the, t at the moment, or do you see signs of progress? I think I had to pass on that one after only six months here, but I, I, it was a clear reflection from me. And um, when it comes to reforms, and, uh, and I choose to see positive that uh, these things are coming. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you can see with your eyes here in, in Shanghai and other places, the investments into the infrastructure. And um, we ourselves also know about the challenges, of course, with lack of infrastructure in some places. And uh, it was spoken about this morning about uh, intermodal and need to increase that. And I think we can support that. We also see our challenges with the plant in Chengdu using the Yangtze River a lot. Uh, it is uh, certainly room for improvements. So I like to hear that as well, which uh, I didn't specifically mention before. Mm. Bill, do you have any reflection on that? I mean, you're obviously looking at um, truck lengths as a, as a potential, uh, potential barrier, I guess, to what you do. I mean, if, if you're looking at a product right now in China, are you, are you holding back because um, of the illegal situation or the illegal lengths? Uh, does that you know, hold you back right now from really moving for, forward? Until the legislation is clearly defined and enforced, uh, I don't believe that we have a good basis on which to go forward here in China. We really do want to get involved in this market. It's the biggest automotive market in the world. And I believe our solution has an absolute direct application into solving this massive problem that you have here. Uh, we do not operate illegally. We don't build illegal equipment. We respect governments and their requirements. We're here to do this job as safely and efficiently as possible. So this is a main barrier for us at this point. It's a stopping point, and we're hoping that the industry, yourselves, and the government can all get together and agree on a standard and stick to it. Then we're going to jump in the game. Yeah. Till then, we're going to hold back and watch. Yeah. I think it would almost be unfair if I put all these questions on Magnus, so I'll actually just make a more general comment, which is that obviously, you know, when I do speak to car makers, some, some say that, you know, we, we're not going to use the trucks and we won't and set it as a rule. 
but maybe they can't see throughout the whole supply chain if it's always the case. Uh, and I think others obviously clearly are because you see them. Um, but maybe on the premium side, and, and certainly brands are building a reputation that there's a danger in using some of that equipment as well. Um, so so a, maybe more reflection on my side than, than a question at this point. But any any uh, points or questions from the audience? I'm guessing not. Magnus, um, you know, as, as Volvo as a premium brand, pushing towards a premium brand, what, what do you see, do you see logistics as a kind of competitive advantage in, in, in any scenarios, and, and obviously maybe beyond just getting it the cheapest way. I mean, what, what, what would you see as a potential competitive advantage? I was thinking about the, the quote that was used earlier today by the representative from Valenius, and um, supply chains compete was uh, mentioned. And in one way that's true, and that's why it's put as a, uh, as a priority and a strategic competence. But at the same time, I see it as uh, not a problem to collaborate and work together with what seems to be competitors. So uh, I have no issue to discuss, uh, I mean, uh, subjects on logistics with representatives of uh, Daimler, mm -hmm. because we can learn from each other and we are not competing in selling cars really on logistics. Uh, it's, it's more about uh, improving uh, our uh, cost level, which helps us to uh, indirectly invest more money in product development, etc. Uh, that being said, uh, for Volvo cars, it is a real priority to stick to our promise to the customers. We have a large share of uh, customer order uh, built cars. And uh, that means already at the dealer, promise a delivery date and stick to that. And that goes all the way back then to order planning through inbound production, availability of material, and delivering on the outbound supply chain. So, yes or no? Could you, could you, could you imagine a scenario in which you, know, you give the, the end customer the visibility to actually see at any point where, where their car might be, and, and that as a kind of almost uh, customer experience, if you like? We're almost there, uh, in, and this is started in, in Sweden. When uh, when you buy, first you go in online and you build your car, and you select exactly what you want to have on your car, and uh, you will get uh, within a week or so a confirmation on the delivery date, and then you can follow. I think believe uh, nine steps from steel coil to delivered car where uh, logistics, uh, transportation contribute with some of the milestones that are calculated at the point of the uh, delivery date promise. Mm. So yes and no again. Yeah. I always think that there's a danger in that because how much does a customer really want to know about their car stuck in some foggy northern European port for six weeks, right? Yeah, um, that, that's why we have the uh, precision KPI, so yeah. we want to get it high. Yeah. yeah. But, but interesting, interesting with the visibility side, I think. I'll give you guys one last chance. Uh, can I comment one more? Yes, please, please. Because I know, I, even I who work for Volvo, I go in and look where the status is of my car yeah. to see if uh, you will uh, commit to that promise. So uh, as, as a car producer. Uh, so I think um, our customers like to see it, especially since they built their car themselves online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Last chance. Ah. It's sort of cheating because it's kind of a colleague, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Ruud Vossebelt. Um, I heard the presentation of Bill Pollock, but I'm very interested uh, from you, Magnus. Um, is the general feeling from the car makers as well that there is too much empty driving, but also shipping in the world? And what is the attitude from the car makers to try to solve that problem? Listening to uh, Bill, I expected that question to come either from Christopher or someone else, <laughs> um, or Bill for that matter. Um, I'm, I'm, I have been discussing this before with, with colleagues in the industry, and I can't really decide uh, between and I don't speak for China now, which was specifically mentioned about up to 50%. But if I, if I talk about Europe, which I have more experience in, then in one way, the market will solve it. Uh, 
the when you award contracts, let's say every other year, uh, the mix of awarded contracts between OEMs and suppliers solve a lot of the imbalance in, in uh, Finnish vehicle distribution. So on one hand, I sort of support that theory. On the other hand, uh, we're also talking about uh, a lot of empty mileage. So I think uh, a KPI for that within the industry is it could help to uh, uh, get it to a me more real discussion. Do you think uh, the automotive car makers can stimulate this uh, initiative in a certain way to, to let's say, uh, push it harder into the markets to get quicker results? I'll, I'll respond like this. I was thinking about who's responsible to drive it. Is it uh, the carriers with their benefits that was described by Bill, or is it the buyer, the end consumer, which in this case would be uh, the OEMs. Um, that's also a difficult question that we can discuss later. Thank you. Thank you, both sides there. I would like to make yep. a comment on this. Uh, the, the standard today is running around empty half the time. It's, I think it's uh, just a bad habit that started about 100 years ago, and everybody's just continued on with it. Today's systems are far, far more advanced than they ever were. And I think it's very difficult now to, to bring in a new concept like this into a highly sophisticated and high-paced, highly competitive industry. Without everybody keeping in theme here, everybody working together, it's going to be difficult to get this thing scaled up. We're not going to see the benefits of this for many years until people start collaborating, working together, and bridging the gaps that exist between today's standard and the future standard. Nowhere in any other transportation sector is it acceptable to run around empty half the time. It just does not exist. Everybody's driven all of that out of their, their systems as much as possible. The auto carrier sector still stands alone with the highest empty mile factor in the world today. So, this is our observation from studying this industry all this time. And I know that the auto manufacturers are all complaining about high costs. We've got to keep driving costs out. And so I encourage all auto manufacturers to support this in spirit even. Yeah, let the market sort itself out, but encourage participation with multifunction equipment. But maybe, I should, maybe I should then... It's a press. Maybe I should then expand on what I mean with let the market solve it. If we can, when we go out to RFQ, if we provide detailed volume forecasts, and if we look at China, where we uh, produce in Chengdu and sell a lot of cars in Shanghai, I do expect that the return flow, the, the party that will win that business, have a lot of return business back to Sichuan. So. Yeah. I agree with you, there's a lot of empty mileage, a lot of potential, but I also agree to my own statement. <laughs> All right. Okay, on that, uh, on that sort of agreeing to disagree sort of point, we're probably going to end it um, unless someone's, no, I think, I think we're, we're good with, was there a question there? Sorry. Okay, we'll take that last question. Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, Greg Boris from the Port of Portland, Oregon. Um, interesting concept, Bill, and um, it occurs to me that as you target general freight, and the backhauls that exist. I think, for instance, on the North America example, uh, the carriers, the ocean carriers that control the containerized car cargo definitely covet the backhauls that they can control and that they have, as do the railroads uh, in terms of uh, their truck conversion programs and attempts to get balance on their networks. Given that model and given what is um, probably a trend towards that model here to some extent in China, how will you target specific freight types? And do you have some examples of where you've been successful already, either in North America or in, uh, in Europe, perhaps, where the, where the product is working, and you're tying that to, uh, to the general cargo gold that you mentioned? My experience uh, originally was in my own transport company uh, out of Western Canada. And I had a, operated a small fleet of uh, trucks there, which uh, transported vehicles into the U.S. out of Canada, um, all, over, all over the U.S. 
and all over Canada. And simply, I, I didn't even integrate our fleet into uh, shipping automotive inbound parts. We shipped uh, new vehicles uh, all over North America, and we shipped general freight coming home. We were able to reduce our empty miles from 37%, which was already a, a better than industry average, down to less than 5%. That was a tremendous uh, uh, lift for our company, and, and we made money from it, made a lot of money from it, and that's how I funded this entire process. So based on my personal experience in this industry, I know that it's entirely possible. Uh, we know of many situations around the world today, and, and, and I can't discuss some of them because they're, they're work in progress today. Um, however, we know of at least uh, 20, 25 situations where vehicles can be shipped from the manufacturing plant out to port and move over one dock and go pick up a container full of parts right back to the same manufacturing plant. So this exists in many places. And these are, this is what we call the low-hanging fruit. It exists all over the world today. And I think as the concept develops over time that, that everybody's going to be able to dig deeper and deeper into their, their operations and find, we'll say, maybe the not-so-obvious opportunities that will come about. But I really don't know the full answer to all of this. The, the logistics experts are in this room and all over the world. We're just providing the equipment that will enable everybody to start looking at new opportunities and how it applies to them directly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna leave it there. Um, we have, obviously, there's plenty more for our panel to talk about, and I hope you will make the effort to, to get to know them. Magnus talked about um, a new supply chain to America, purchasing colleague being here. Bill is obviously looking, looking to, to partner with China, so, and there's just two, two examples of, of, of kind of what we're here for these, these days, so, so do take advantage. Uh, during these coffee breaks coming up in the Gala Dinner tonight, just a quick reminder, the next session we're going to be talking about e-commerce. Obviously, this is usually important in China and actually starting to have a big impact in automotive as well. So we'll reflect on, on the intersection there. And uh, then we'll go straight to the Gala Dinner. So uh, maybe you want to come to this next session kind of ready to leave uh, afterwards because the coaches will, will be ready to go. And or, like I mentioned in the beginning, if you want to go yourself, please get a, feel free to get the, the driving directions from our registration desk. Uh, but now thanks again to all of you for, for participation, and we'll see you again. Thanks.